We are here in Waterloo. I think my reception is now good again, coming under from under the ground. We, oui. it's heavy, yeah. Then we're coming here on the battlefield. Okay, I have to go up into the panorama. You will see soon more. Moment, you have to go up into the panorama. Do, do. Can hear me fine. That's really good. The reception is not everywhere as good. So I don't know. Did you see the soldier that was in the in the lane before? Did some of you see that or not? Or was it just uh, just only me? I don't know. No, okay, no, doesn't matter. <laughs> hello everyone, yes, hello everyone. Okay, I'm going up to the panorama deck. So, it's a very interesting panorama that we have over here. There's a big sort of a red tent hanging over us. I think it's 30 degrees inside here. It's quite warm, but we're getting on the battlefield just for the first minutes before okay welcome in waterloo <laughs> and hello from waterloo in canada look at this this is amazing it's a 360 degree Degrees painting of the Battle of Waterloo. It's unbelievable. A cyclorama, exactly. A cyclorama, something that in the start of the 20th century was very, very popular. So, we're even Look, they try to make it as realistic as possible. Even with some bodies laying here on the ground in front of the painting. Now the French war. Oh my God, this, I was hearing a cat or I don't know, I think it was a horse. But this is wonderful and 360 degrees and we're standing here on top of what used to be uh, what used to be the British positions yeah Duke Wellington with his army was standing over here so a little higher when they were attacked by uh, when they were attacked by the French so over here at this side we can see the French army coming nearby napoleon himself can we see a little at the back of the painting on his horse a little smaller and yeah what can i say about it it's just a mess it's just a mess everywhere it's a little dark here for me to see because of the contrast but Welcome all in Waterloo and in this was made in 1912 so almost 100 years after the Battle of Waterloo and it is made to after 100 years of the war so specifically for that uh, for that moment by the French painter the army painter Dumoulin he was not doing that this by the way uh, on his uh, on his own um, he had a whole team working on it and you can maybe imagine that because all the work that you have to do to paint this 360 degrees and over 100 meters of painting in total imagine that trying to get the battle to have the feeling of how the battle was how terrible the battle was on waterloo in 1815 
June 18, 1815, so a little over 200 years ago. By, by the way, when it was exactly 200 years ago in 2015, they, 2015, they did a, a very big reconstruction. And, oh, most probably a lot of PTSD, yes, for sure. And we're now looking, yeah, I'm looking around the whole time. So uh, at this moment, I think we're looking west. We're looking west. So there are little signs over here. So you can see we're now looking at Bren Laleu. So in my best French. And that is a little west from here. And Waterloo itself, uh, Waterloo, Belgium, not Waterloo, Canada, of course. Uh, <laughs> but Waterloo... Uh, now Waterloo is in uh, a little outside of Brussels. So I moved, or I transferred. I, I traveled from uh, from Brussels all the way, all the way, all the way. It's not that far. Uh, it's about twenty minutes away from Brussels, from the city center. And then it's getting quiet. Slowly, I'm only hearing the crowds. The battle is over. Only dead people, bodies dead. Bodies, dead, horses, everything is left. Wow, it's really the combination for me of the, I don't know how that feels for you, but the combination of the, of the sound and what you see all over here is really, wow, intense. It almost feels like that you're really on the battleground. Evocative, <laughs> that's a more beautiful word, yeah. <laughs> I see that the tour started already, so let me just show you for a little while my face. Hi, and welcome everyone in uh, Waterloo. So I am now in a part of the exhibition that is made around the big fight of Waterloo in 18, 18 June of 1815, so a little over 200 years ago now. And uh, there are several parts that I'm gonna show you in this area and some stories that I'm gonna tell. I mean, I'm not really uh deep i'm not going really deep into the war and war tactics and all that kind of things i just want to give you the feeling of this uh, of, of this location and i'm now gonna change my name is stefan by the way because the war in the panorama here is starting we can hear troops are coming Now looking east, by the way, you can see the sun is coming inside. So what we hear now is are the French, because the British were a little on a higher ridge. They were in some ridges and a little on some higher grounds. And the French under Napoleon came to attack, came to attack. And this is a little how it felt. You see the bodies everywhere, thousands and thousands of soldiers that were fighting, fighting for the freedom in Europe, fighting soldiers from France, from, the, from England, from Russia, from Germany, what at that time was called Prussia, uh, Dutch soldiers, Belgian ones, everyone, all in this, big battle nearby Waterloo. Look at that. It's really realistic how they placed all the bodies and horses and everything. And the sound, we hear the sound of the, of the guns, we hear the sound of horses. enormous mess. You can imagine it took the painter a long time to paint this completely. You hear English, I'm hearing French, I'm hearing Dutch sometimes, so Polish, because these were the armies of several of the allies against the French, all against the French, against Napoleon and his French army, of course. Extremely hot today. 
It was not on the day of the battlefield, it was not so hot. It was in June, but it was after some very wet days. So we can still see the clouds, the clouds above the battlefield. And of course the fire. Imagine how this, how this felt if you were there, all these young men, mainly young men that were fighting. Here's one of the ridges where they were hiding. Of course, that was good against the, the guns and the cannons. And this was then going on for hours and hours and hours. The whole day, it took the whole day. The fights over here took the whole day. And at the end of the day, thousands of people were killed. Unbelievable to think about it if you we will go outside and then you will see how beautiful and relaxed it is right now compared to this extreme mess that we see over here. Okay. Okay, I'm going outside now because there's outside a lot more to see. And there must be a lot of ghosts. Yeah, Marta, I'm really happy. I'm really happy that I'm now here at daytime because you <laughs> you don't want to know. And that's, that's one of the things that over here you can see in the, um, in the background there are woods. Ar around here there are several woods and one of them is the woods between Waterloo and uh, between Waterloo and Brussels. And what they're saying and I I had earlier, uh, earlier this week, did a ghost tour about Leuven, and I was reading one of the stories about Leuven, one of the ghost stories. It's not about Leuven itself, but it's about these woods, and they're calling it the woods of the ice. So, I don't know if there's a relationship between all the men, mainly men, who were killed over here. So, but yeah, this, this diorama is, is amazing. And imagine it is made in 1912. In that time, the best way of giving people the feeling how it was in the war. I mean, nowadays, of course, we would have a film with some famous Hollywood stars. Uh, most of the time projected, most of the time about uh, World, War One, uh, World War II, because that's the most fresh war, but yeah, we have been so many wars in all these times. And yes, Carol, it's a 1912 by the French painter Dumoulin. A war painter, by the way. Okay. The war is over again. I'm going outside. Only hearing some dying horses and the first crows that are coming. Going outside. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and over here we try to have it the complete picture of what we were just seeing. The full diorama is here then <laughs> as a reproduction. So you can see it completely. This was, is what we were just seeing only then 360 degrees around us. So, okay, I have to go out again. I'm gonna show you my face just for a little while. Hello and welcome again in Waterloo in, uh, in Belgium, where I am right now. I'm gonna take you outside, outside of the panorama. That's, that, that's how this uh, building is called with the diorama, the panorama. And uh, I'm now going outside. Outside is even 34 degrees Celsius, so it is cooler over here than, uh, than outside. So oh, I'm just gonna show myself a little more because there are more people coming now. One moment. <laughs> okay. I'm outside, I'm outside. So I'm gonna show you where now, sure. I'm gonna still gonna show you a little more of my face and I wanna really wanna welcome you now really in, uh, in, in, in Waterloo. And I'm standing 
next to one of the, the big memorial that is placed over here after the war, several years after 1815. And you can see it is very sunny, so I'm going to use my sunglasses. And I'm, you see, my hair is even wet because it's 34 degrees. And I'm, uh, I'm not built for that. I'm just a, a Dutch guy uh, used to live in a cold country. So 34 degrees is, uh, <laughs> is too, uh, too warm for me. But uh, before, I'm gonna take you around. I just wanna tell you some little things about European history. And I just, I just don't want to do it that much. Um, but uh, in Europe, in the, at the end of the 18th century, start of the 19th century was really a moment that uh, things, things were changing. Things were changing. Several countries were becoming stronger. Others were becoming less strong. And one of the strongest countries or one of the strongest nations at, in that moment was France. And France still had, until the end uh, of the 18th century, they had a king. Uh, several kings in a row and all of them uh, were called Lodewijk. So lo from Lodewijk the first until Lodewijk the, six the, the 16th. And that man, that man Lodewijk the 16th, he was one with bad luck because in 1798, the French Revolution, uh, he was overthrown. And not only that, he was even killed. He was killed under one of the modern inventions of the French and exactly King Louis, King Louis the 16th, I have to say, because they have, they're all, uh, were called uh, Lodewijk or, uh, Lod sorry, Lodewijk that is in Dutch, but it's Louis, you're right. Uh, I'm sometimes switching all these countries and that's again over here. Half it is in French, half it is in Dutch, and then also some in English. So uh, thank you, Beverly and Alison. Uh, no, but shortly after the French Rev Revolution, um, of course, the king was overthrown after, after uh, yeah, King Louis was uh, overthrown after generations and generations. So there was a vacuum, there was a vacuum in power. And there was a young guy from Corsica named Napoleon Bonaparte. And he was, a, he was, he was from a poor family, but he was a brilliant military. He was a brilliant strategist in military strategy. And he was climbing the ranks just after, uh, after the end of uh, King Louis. Um, and uh, he was going better in the ranks. And then in the end, in, um, in 1799, he became so, uh, so powerful that he became the, uh, the general, the, the big general of the French army. And shortly after that, as a general, he made sure that he became the di a dictator. Or you can also say he became King Napoleon, because it was still a little uh, like in the old times. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, if you are very powerful, what you're doing then, then you're naming yourself a king. And uh, he did that. Yeah, Emperor King. That's true. Oh, I thought I did some media to this tour, but uh, no, no, didn't do. No, he uh, he became uh, the king or the emperor or however you you call it of France, and um, and he crowned himself exactly. He crowned himself because it was the norm before these times that uh, it was always uh, the father was uh, giving it over to the son and was crowning, and in this time he was crowning himself because yeah, he uh, he said like I'm the most powerful man. So he did that in 1804 and shortly after that he started by uh, capturing bit by bit parts of Europe. So there were a lot of other strong countries um, and um, he, he was starting to, to make war, uh, to go to the north. So Belgium and also the Netherlands became part of the French Empire. Uh, but not only that, also he attacked Italy, he attacked uh, Prussia, what now is Germany, he attacked uh, several other countries. And the more he was attacking, the more he was attacking, the more he was thinking like, oh, I'm the rightful uh, king of the whole of Europe. So not only from France, no, all these others. And he was going more and more and more east. And then Napoleon really made a mistake. He made a mistake that he thought, oh, I can also capture Russia. He was, by the way, not the only one who made this mistake. About uh, 120, 130 years after him, a German, uh, uh, a German dictator tried the same. So he tried to capture Russia and his army was very strong. But the Russians, they were very smart because they knew that in a battle, they would never win from Napoleon and his armies. So what they were doing instead, 
uh, and it became winter time, that's true. They were going away, so they were fleeing. And what they were doing, they were leaving nothing behind. So they were leaving nothing behind. So the soldiers were getting more and more into Russia. And Russia, it is, of course, an extremely big country. And winter was starting. And uh, every time the soldiers were thinking, the French soldiers were thinking, okay, the next city we will capture, there will be food, there will be housing, there will be all that kind of things. But what were the Russians doing? No, they were burning everything behind them. So exactly the burnt, burnt soil strategy. So uh, in every language you have about, about the same, by the way. So he did that and um, he, he lost in the end that war. Uh, he lost that war with, um, with Russia. He came back then to France and then they were saying like, okay, you're not the best one. You're not the best one to lead us. So they were sending him to an island for, so he could stay there the rest of his life. But what happened with Napoleon? He escaped. He escaped and then there were some armies sent after him to arrest him. But the thing is, instead of arresting him, these armies were thinking, this Napoleon, he's our great general. He is the one that we really respect. So uh, we're gonna fight for him. So we're gonna fight for him again. So he came back. And we're calling that the time, the 100 days that Napoleon came back. And uh, in, the, in these 100 days, several of his, uh, several of his uh, armies, the, let's call it the Allies, so the Russians, the English, the Dutch, the Belgian, the Polish, uh, all, these, all these countries, they were building up their, their own armies. And they were a little done with what Napoleon was trying to do. So they were preparing for one big last war. So and Napoleon, uh, yeah, Napoleon knew this, of course. So what he was thinking, okay, they're now building it up, but I am still brilliant. I'm brilliant compared to all the other generals and armies. So I have to hit them earlier. So I have to go there with my best, uh, with my best troops, hit them very hard, and that will be the only way to make sure that uh, they will not, uh, they will not uh, attack me on a later moment when they are too strong. So that was his big plan. And there were several armies, and most of them were on the north eastern part of France. So uh, he got there with his, uh, with a big part of his army about 70,000 people and these different armies were meeting each other at the place where I am right now and that is in Waterloo. So I'm just gonna change, you see that it's, um, there's an interesting, uh, interesting, uh, but very peaceful part. I see some soldiers there still, look at that, you could take a, uh, you could take a guided tour in the museum by one of these uh, by one of these soldiers, just to give the idea of how they, how they were looking. Wait, let me go a little more nearby. I'm not the only one uh, filming them. The march. <laughs> Poor soldiers. Yeah, they, they are they're quite they're quite warm. That's true. That's true. Okay, let me go a little into the shade. So So yeah, what we see over here on the side there is a very big mount. And this mount is made over here. Uh, so to remember all the casualties that were falling in this uh, in in this war, so it's the Mount of the Lion. We can see on top there's a very big lion, and next to it this is the panorama where we were before. So that's a little a newer building. Uh, oh, there we have the soldier again. I love this guy in his uh, <laughs> in his uniform. So <laughs> I'm doing my best, David. I'm doing my best. So I thought. If I'm in Brussels this time, I always, for the flower parade, after three flower tours, I'm always preparing myself for, some, for something else. So I thought, okay, let's take you to this beautiful, but also sad location over here. 
So on the right side, the mount of the lion. On the left side, the beautiful, uh, some beautiful trees. That's the only place with good shade. And uh, <laughs> the soldier was wearing sneakers, yeah. <laughs> I think that was the only one that were from himself. So, but uh, <laughs> you were seeing that very well, Paula. Or at least one of them. The other one, I think, has had more traditional, uh, more traditional shoes. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna climb to the top. And with this weather, you can imagine that is not so easy, uh, but we're gonna do it. So I have my mountaineering gear with me. I mean, I'm not so used, of course, uh, to mountains. If you're living in the Netherlands, this is for us really a mountain, not a hill, no, a mountain. So <laughs> I will take my time. So, and there are steep stairs. It's like a little, like a pyramid. Although it is, uh, it is completely, it's a completely round. And oh, wait, 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 wait! They're gonna show, they're gonna show how these cannons are working. Sorry, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but there is a. Let me show you this. Okay, there is some shadow over here. Pour les francophones, euh, je ferai les explications si ce sera avec moi euh, de ce que tu si euh, sur les bancs. Pour euh, les autres, pour les anglais, tu peux aller avec mon collègue en red. Oh, I can, I can choose. I can choose. Should I go for the Dutch or should I go for the English? Up to you. Up, up to me. Or for the French. <laughs> some of these old uh, cannons are standing over here so several of them <laughs> English please okay I will do I will do I don't know what was going, going to happen or maybe just gonna tell so welcome to the Cantrop demonstration over here we have Le Brutal the Brutal one that's the nickname we've given to our French four pounder cannon so back in the day, every can would be given its own nickname. You understand this one quickly enough when we get ready to fire it. You're gonna fire it? Yes. Cool. So cool. it's called a four pounder. We fire a cannonball that weighs four pounds, which is roughly two kilos, mm -hmm. about the size of my fist. And that would be the smallest cannon the French army had. And by Waterloo in 1815, it's obsolete. It's too small and won't do enough damage. So instead of using the four pounders, the French and British armies will use six, eight, and 12 pounders. Whereas the Prussians will use five, seven, and nine pounders. That doesn't change much. The only thing it changes, the, louder, the bigger the cannon, the louder the noise it will make, and the further the projectile will be sent. The four pounder can still send the projectile up to 700 meters in a straight line, which is pretty impressive. That's over three times as far as a musket. What's even better is, with one of these, you can be accurate, you can hit what you're aiming for which helps. Additionally, in the museum you'll see the film where the cannonballs hit the ground and explode. That's not normally what would happen. These cannonballs would hit the hard ground, it's right, and bounce up and can go up to a kilometre. Oh wow. Now, the bigger ones can go up to two kilometres and take out up to 30 men. Our one on average will take out eight to ten men. Still fairly good. It's got a muscle, a muzzle velocity of 400 metres a second which means the cannonball is moving at 400 meters a second every time you fire it. That's enough for the shockwave to break someone's arm without touching them. Normally, the, uh, this gun would need a team of eight men to reload and fire it, and they can do it twice a minute. There's only three of us today, so the team is a little bit long. <laughs> but we'll fire it, eventually. Eventually. But no. And in, in the French artillery, they're very well trained. They're some of the best in Europe. For several reasons. Firstly, Napoleon was an officer in the artillery, so he knows the importance of cannons, but also they're constantly improving, they're constantly getting bigger and more powerful. So in uh, at the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, there was one cannon per thousand men. Ten years later, here at Waterloo, we three cannons per thousand men. So in three years, we've tripled the quantity of the artillery on the battlefield. So in a few moments, we're going to move on to firing it. Two things. 
folk sagde i folk, det kan han. Safe. Thank you. You can stand where you are, you can go a bit closer. Don't go in front of anyone. Just not in the front. Sort of stay by the, behind the bench. Second thing is, it's going to make some noise. So what the artillery used to do is put a finger in their ear and open their mouth like this. You do look extremely stupid, but I'm not taking pictures, so no one will <laughs> Afterwards, I'll come back with a few more explanations, and if you've got any questions, I'll ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Okay, just uh, <laughs> releases the pressure exactly. <laughs> okay, I hope you can all see it from over here. I love how all three of them have these beautiful. Oh, and he was telling you they're normally. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm not letting you hear it in the native language. Wait, I'm just going a little to the front, not completely, of course. <laughs> it was just warning us a little <laughs> for the explosion. So, and the people are holding their ears already. Okay, so <laughs> that was a lot of noise, wasn't it? There? I hope that someone that's that that someone has exactly the postcard at the right moment with the explosion. So if you have that, please uh, please uh, share it with me. So uh, and I'm now uh, I'm now going uh, up to where I was supposed to go to. So this was just a little extra. That's the lovely thing of live touring so <laughs> and it was good also for me to hear some more french again so and as you maybe know as a as a dutch person they are teaching us uh, they're teaching us uh, several languages one of them of course dutch that is the first one and then english now you can hear that uh, but also french and uh, french and german so I'm speaking a little French and a little German. So, and we're going now up to uh, what we call in French the La Butte de Lyon. So as you can see over here, or the Heuvel met de Leeuw in Dutch, or the Leeuwenhoogel in German, or the Lion's Mount in English. You can also say that the word lion is almost in every, uh, in every language almost the same. So and yeah, we're going up. It's about 40 meters high, 224 steps with, uh, well, I think now 32 degrees, only 32 degrees. So it's not that bad anymore. So I don't know. Is, uh, we're now going up like this the whole way, 224 steps to meet the lion at the top. Off we go. Are you ready? There we go. I have, I'm sporting a lot, so uh, don't worry, uh, don't worry about me. I can handle this. Although 40 meters with this temperature is different. Am I ready? I am ready. I'm going already. 
So we will have a beautiful view over the surrounding and you will see that not a lot changed since the time of Napoleon. It's still farmland. Oh, look at the little kid also going down. So, okay, just let me have my face for a while. Merci. Merci, thank you. So, the rule is people going up have the right of way compared to people going down. Okay, I'm well, I'm gonna talk a little less because I'm feeling it now. And Fraser, I will tell you at the top a little more about this hill and why, etc. It's really already beautiful. Hopefully, not too windy. It's cooler here. or so. Okay. More photo shoots. Let's see. Oh, I'm not French. Almost there. Let's go. Last part. Feeling my coughs now, but that's good. Okay, oh. over here we're on the top right now. Yeah. It's good you don't have to do it yourself now anymore. If you're coming here one day, we see the lion. We see the lion on the top, and this whole mount or hill or whatever how you're calling it is is made shortly after 1815 so around 1820 and it is done by the Dutch king the Dutch king Willem William uh, most of the Dutch kings were William like the French were all Louis the Dutch were all Willem we have again a Willem at this moment so <laughs> catch your breath yeah no no don't worry I will catch it while uh, while talking. I'm not used to uh, to shut my mouth. Not so anymore as a tour guide. Hopefully it's not too windy, by the way. No, but the... <laughs> Thank you, Barrett. That would be appreciated. I found a place where I can have a beer. The only thing is, is I'm with the car, so I can only have one. And these Belgian beers are quite strong. So... I would love to have several ones, but no. Okay, here we can see all the battlefields, all the battlefields, and it's a little, with some little uh, farms here and there. It is almost the same as what it was in the time of 1815. So thank you, John and Collect. It's appreciated. So, and while we're standing over here, there is a a beautiful mark over here that is showing beautiful, beautiful plate that is showing how the different armies were approaching each other. So we're standing here and all the red ones were the army of the Duke of Wellington. So the British Duke of Wellington, I think you heard about, uh, heard about his name. They were waiting here. They were waiting so they had the best positions. But the, the good thing to know is that the Duke of Wellington, he had an army, but his army was not very well trained. And not only that, it was also based on partly uh, troops from England, but there were also a lot of Dutch and Belgium and Polish soldiers. So it was a whole combination, a combination. And the French, Napoleon with his troops, they were coming from the other side. So they were coming from this location. So where we see the, the little wood there in the end. And they were coming over here and he brought his most experienced 
uh, army. Most of the men in that army already uh, had several wars before, so they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. And the size of the army was about the same. About 70,000 70, uh, French and also about 70,000 from the Duke of Wellington. So they were waiting over here for the French, uh, for Napoleon and his armies. And uh, what you have to know is that there was also a third army. The third army was under the general Blucher. Blucher, you can see his name over here. Um, and uh, he was w coming with, uh, with the second army, a Russian army. And, uh, but he was a little further away. So the, arm, the both armies were not together yet. And the thing is, you have to know that the days before the big fight, it has been raining. It has been raining a lot. And um, exactly, Alison, yeah, that is uh, that kind of things that can go a lot deeper, but I want to do just the, uh, just the more general things, but you're right. The more experienced army was fighting in the US at that, uh, at that moment and for the uh, War of 1812 that was just uh, three years before. So they were not in Europe at that moment. So, uh, but they were, they were waiting over here. It had been raining several times and we just saw that uh, the, the cannons that they, were, that they were using, Napoleon had a lot of these cannons. The only thing is because of all the rain, the fields around here were completely muddy. So he could not he could not get his cannons very nearby. So, and they were delaying also the army. So what he did is on the day, on the June 18th, 1815, is that he was thinking, okay, um, it is now still so wet in the morning. It stopped raining that day. It stopped raining. And he thought like, let's wait some hours before we're gonna attack the English. And we will win from the English because Napoleon knew that the army of the Duke of Wellington was not that strong and not so experienced. So, um, but he thought like, let's wait until the uh, most of the wet stuff and the mud is a little dry so I can also use my cannons. And that was a stupid mistake because these hours of waiting, and I'm not talking about five, six hours that he was waiting, it made sure that the other army here on the side could come more nearby. So at the moment that Napoleon was attacking the British, they were holding, they were holding, they were holding them. And then from the side, uh, the second army was attacking the French. And also the second army was not that experienced, but Napoleon didn't expect them anymore. So, uh, and Alison is good uh, to to add something sometimes. That's that's okay. I'm not uh, I'm not a I'm not a specialist of uh, of uh, this uh, <laughs> of this war. So just want to show you some of the main things. Uh, so in the end, he made the mistake by not attacking early enough. Most probably, if he did uh, did his first fight earlier, he would have won because then he could have won from the English, and then later on having the best positions here, a little higher and a little on higher ground. And then when the second army was attacking, they would have uh, already the first one. So the first win. So that was what they, uh, what he should have done, but he did not do, he did not do. He waited and because of that, after nine hours of fighting, he lost this big war. So, oh, look at this, what we have over here. Look what we have over here. <laughs> this little bear is always wants to join me. So <laughs> the bear, yeah, he loves uh, he loves some war history. <laughs> Oscar, yeah, Oscar is here, so he is uh, he is uh, with with me today. Um, no, so and after the war, after the war, of course, this was the last war against Napoleon. He lost more than 45,000 of his soldiers, of his army of 70,000. And the British took uh, only lost about 20,000. So that's a lot, that's a lot less compared to that still. It's a lot of bodies and wounded people. So imagine that, imagine the battlefield afterwards. Uh, but of course, Napoleon was, uh, 
defeated, was now finally defeated after his 100 days of, uh, of, of, of coming back. And, um, and that was of course something to celebrate. That was something to celebrate for all the, uh, for all the allies. And one of the allies was were the Dutch. So we played a role because we were part, part of the army of the Duke of Wellington. And the Dutch king, King William I, what he said is like, okay, because in that time, it was still, this part was still part of the Netherlands. Um, so he said like, let's build uh, this big mount over here, 40 meters high, 40 meters high, I'm sorry for the wind. And on top, we are placing a lion. And why a lion? Uh, and that is because that is also in the Dutch coat of arms. In the Dutch coat of arms, there is a lion and exactly at this location where we're standing right now, uh, his son, later uh, the future king of the Netherlands, was, uh, was wounded because he was hit by uh, was hit by a gun and uh, he was wounded on his on his shoulder and he wanted to have this big lion over here. From here we cannot see it very well. You can just see his tail a little apart. It's more from downstairs. Like, oh, and everyone is sitting now here in the shade or in the shadow. I can imagine that. And Michaela, that is a really good question because that's exactly what I now wanna wanna tell you. Can you imagine there were tens of thousands of bodies laying on the floor. And then the first thing is what happened is that there were people coming over here uh, to collect the teeth of the soldiers. So, Oh, sorry, is this at the... Wait, no. I'm just gonna... One moment. Too much wind. What I'm gonna do then is getting my earphones. I'm sorry for this. This is a beautiful uh, piece of stone that you're now looking at. <laughs> yeah, now it's fine because I'm now out of the wind. A little. Let me see. Can you now uh, can you now hear me? Okay, that's really good. I think it's uh, working already. So okay, some people be placing their names over there. Some people never not do that. Okay, I'm going down. So I hope you can hear me now better because I'm using my earphones. But it's still windy. We can see that we are going 224 steps down. That's a lot easier. On the side, we see again the panorama from the side. Also beautiful with the, uh, or what I really like is that the light is coming from the top. It's one of these modern techniques uh, that, that was quite new. For example, in Amsterdam, the Rijksmuseum was one of the first museums where they had light from the top instead of from windows from the side. And it's a lot better if you want to have good light for your uh, for pictures uh, for paintings for example so no direct light or almost no direct light okay so no but then back to back to the soldiers what happened is that a lot of these uh, uh, soldiers were laying over here and in that time uh, there were people going to the bodies and they were rem removing the teeth and why do you think they were removing the teeth in these times so just a question, maybe one of you, no, and it was not that they all had gold teeth, no, most of them were poor, poor soldiers, so they didn't have uh, gold to replace if they were missing one, no, for something else, exactly, Guan, making dentures, making dentures, it was people from all over Europe were, were getting to battlefields, to get teeth to make dentures, and um, they loved to come over here, and that is, because um, the Waterloo teeth, exactly, the Waterloo teeth, Katie, uh, they were mostly from young men. So they were young teeth still, from men of 18, 19, 20 years old. So uh, that's a better quality for your denture than if it is from old men. You can maybe imagine. Look at my, you see my shadow? It's now just over there. That is me. I'm now waving at all of you, wait. So that was the teeth. First, the teeth were removed. I'm waving now to all of you. Hello, hello, hello. 
<laughs> okay, getting back more serious. I'm talking about serious things and now. Okay, now that uh, that were the teeth. And then of course there was still a lot more of the bodies, and we're now talking about 1815. And 1815, uh, they were using the bones. So first they were placed in graves, but later on in mass graves. But later on, a lot of these graves were emptied for all the bones. And why were they doing that? Because in these times, these pieces of the body were used, if you are grinding the bones, then you're getting really good fertilizer. <laughs> so, <laughs> imagine that. Imagine that. So, the interesting thing is, that here on the battlefields, there are almost no, uh, there are almost no bodies found. So uh, they have been trying, and very recently, I think about two weeks ago, there was uh, it was in the news of our, I was seeing an article that uh, they found a horse. So that was quite unique. And next to that, they found only uh, about ten bodies in total in this in this area. So <laughs> unbelievable, isn't it? after so tens of thousands of bodies and then you can almost not find it over here but yeah the ground now over here is very rich so <laughs> very rich because of all these bones that were used as fertilizer <laughs> here are some more of the yeah basically everything was recycled yeah and that's not with all the wars by the way uh but with uh, this war with this war it was so and how many people were killed yeah we're all, always talking about casualties in, in total, and casualties means killed and wounded, uh, and that is over 50,000. Uh, oh, look at this. Hopefully it's uh, not loaded right now. Um, <laughs> no, but there are, they don't know exactly the number of people that were, that, that were killed, but they're guessing somewhere between 20 and 30,000. 30, so it's still a lot, still a lot. And then if you have all the wounded people, and maybe also people that were, killed at a later moment or they were dying at a later moment and these cannons it i don't know if they are replicas or not i could not say but if they are replicas they're really in a good uh, uh they're really in a good state still so now and there's also one other story by the way oh so here what i can do i can show you again the lion so the lion is on top over there and uh it is not true but there's a beautiful beautiful story that king william the first he asked the people who made this statue to use for the steel because the line is from steel to use the leftovers of some of the french cannons that there were found here in this area so uh that is not true but i love the i love the story about it so that is what i can uh, <laughs> That's, uh, he's not lying, he's standing. Yes, Carol. <laughs> You're winning the prize for the best dead joke of the day. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Uh, so, <laughs> now I'm just going a little back to the shadow. They're still also there showing over here uh, in one of the, some of the camps where they were uh, with all the soldiers, imagine that in this area there were over 100,000 soldiers from different armies and they also had to sleep and they had to eat. So it was an enormous operation to uh, to do all of that. And I can zoom in on the line, but I'm going to do that when I'm in the shadow, if that's okay. Or maybe... Uh, yes, Jennifer, there's a very high-tech uh, museum, for sure. So, okay, let's get out of the sun. Yes, oh wow, look at this. Yeah, there's a beautiful museum, uh, but it's not really good to use that for, for a tour because that's with a lot of insulations and dark parts and it's partly underground. It's partly underground, so uh, I didn't even have any reception over there. So uh, look at this, look how beautiful people walking on top. Yeah, it was very high tech, so they were using a lot of uh, video and animations and all that all that kind of things so it's really well done so i showed you the 
20th century version <laughs> in the panorama. That was how they used to do. But the 21st century ver version is, uh, oh, that's the wrong one. I wanted to zoom out again. Uh, but that's uh, even a more beautiful one. So, but this is nice, isn't it? So, yeah. Okay, thank you for uh, for joining me today over here in Waterloo. Not bad this tour. Okay, no, thank you for that. <laughs> I hope it was a little more than a not bad tour. Okay, thank you for joining and with the sun going down, I was thinking I can almost uh, play uh, Waterloo Sunset, but that's uh, <laughs> that's the next time maybe. <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you for joining today. I hope you uh, I hope you had a good time. Thank you for all the tips. I uh, hope to see you. I uh, hope to see you again another time, uh, maybe here in Waterloo or another location. I will go back to uh, I will go back to uh, to Amsterdam. Hopefully I can make it with this uh, with, with, with this heat, but uh, uh, I hope you had a good time. I had a good time to show you around despite the, the temperature. Now you can see how heated I am uh, from uh, and how sweaty I am. So I'm uh, going home, getting some, uh, some uh, first maybe one beer, then getting home, having a shower and preparing some other tours for later in the week. I think the next one that I'm doing after these three days of Belgium, uh, I, will be back in, uh, I will be back in Amsterdam. And I will do a night tour on Thursday, so I'm really looking forward to do uh, to show my own city again because it has been a, a long, a long time ago that I could that I could do that. So that will be uh, that will be on uh, on Thursday, and of course I will go back to uh, I will go back to Belgium for sure. So how far are you away from home? Yeah, that's about uh, three hours, three three and a half hours by car. Yeah, no, it's three I think. So uh, it's still uh, so that's also why I can only have uh, one uh, one beer only. So <laughs> otherwise it's, it's, it's too much and it's not safe. So thank you again for joining. I love you. I know that this is what uh, my famous colleague in St. Petersburg is doing all the time. Love that she's do doing that. So thank you for joining. Thanks for all the tips. 
uh, I didn't all name you because the sun was in my face the whole time and I was doing all these uh, history stories. So uh, I hope to see you another time. Bye bye. Tot ziens. Adieu. <laughs> or uh, au revoir. Maybe that's the better to say from over here. Ciao.